Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Counterterrorism Today, the premier podcast of the International Institute for Counterterrorism. I'm Itai Handman, and it is truly a pleasure to be here with you today discussing the ins and outs of terrorism. And we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak. She is the assistant professor at the Louder School of Government Diplomacy and Strategy. She serves as the academic head of the International Program in Government and senior researcher at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, the head of the Law Desk at the ICT, award winning author of the book Underground Warfare. Dr. Richmond Barak, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. Thank you, Itai. It's really a pleasure to have you on uh, a very important topic here. We're going to be discussing the latest round of violence that we saw in uh, Gaza between Israel and the Palestinian terrorist organizations, Hamas and Islamic Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, we'll take a look at the ICC and we'll try to look at, um, I guess, the conflict through the lens of an international lawyer such as yourself and how um, the crimes that people accuse both sides of uh, how they play out. And if people are just accusing for the sake of accusing, or are we looking at war um, and, or, or at war crimes? And I think it's very interesting that all this is happening while um, the head prosecutor at the ICC is actually in the process of changing over at the moment. And the previous one has just completed her term and a new prosecutor from the UK is coming in and so I want to take a look and examine everything from the lens of an expert from uh, the International Law Department, such as yourself. So Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak, let's start there. Um, what were your thoughts uh, originally on the uh, Operation Guardian of the Walls? Uh, how do you think that from an, a law perspective that that conflict was fought? Thank you, Ita. Yes, this is a very important topic, uh, this latest confrontation between Israel and Hamas. Um, to be honest, I don't know um, if I look at it mostly from the perspective of international law. Yes, for sure, that influences the way I analyze the event. But um, as you mentioned, I also published a book on underground warfare. So for me, this was also, and perhaps most importantly, because the international law, legal issues, they kind of tend to be always the same, right? Was this a legitimate target? Was this a proportionate uh, strike? And I'm happy to discuss it. So Ita, you mentioned that I'm, uh, that I'm an international lawyer and this is through that lens that I um, mostly looked at operation and analyzed Operation Guardian of the Wolves, the latest confrontation between Israel and Hamas. But uh, you also mentioned that I wrote a book on underground warfare and as a result, uh, a lot of my outlook on this operation was also from the perspective of this unique terrain, the subterranean, right? The use of tunnels by Hamas um, and the fact that this was yet again another operation where tunnels stole the spotlight um, and one of the declared objectives of the IDF was indeed to, um, uh, to inflict a, a blow onto the underground infrastructure of Hamas inside the Gaza Strip. So I guess it's a combination of both. So very interesting. Um, let's start there then with the tunnels uh, and examine that uh, through your expertise on underground warfare. This particular conflict um, definitely had an element of extreme, um, not extreme, sorry, had an element of purpose from the IDF in the sense of that they had a goal, as you mentioned, to potentially take out as many underground targets as possible. So when we look at those underground targets, the most prominent in this conflict was what the IDF de dubbed the Hamas metro system that ran underground throughout the Gaza Strip. Uh, what we know that it ran underneath hospitals, schools, mosques, homes, um, businesses, industry, because it was like a metro system that ran underground throughout the Gaza Strip. Um, can you give us a little bit of explanation on that specific tunnel, its purpose, uh, to your knowledge, understanding the legal ramifications of building something like that, that is for the sole purpose of military use? Absolutely. So you referred to the, to the name, the Metro, which is, of course, the way the IDF refers to this incredibly sophisticated uh, underground complex system of network of tunnels. 
um, spreading these days all over the Gaza Strip. Um, in the past, it used to be quite contained under the Gaza City, but now, as we've seen, it really spread, you know, north and south uh, of the Gaza Strip, um, going kilometers uh, of tunnels. So what we know about this system is, first of all, that the name that the IDF decided to give to it is quite misleading. Uh, when, we, when we think about the metro, we think about a civilian infrastructure, right? We think about something that helps people go around, go about their business, go to work, go pick up their children. This is not at all what we're talking about here. And so I think it's, it's important to kind of like uh, reframe things a little bit or at least clarify. This is an infrastructure that is used um, almost exclusively. Yeah, we, don't, we don't know about any civilian use of that network, okay? What we do know is that this is a place where Hamas, um, that Hamas uses as its control, command and control uh, centers. They are placed underground. This is uh, a terrain. This is the, the underground is also a location where Hamas uh, stores its uh, weapons, um, rockets, even rocket launchers. This, the, the rockets are being launched from these underground structures that are built especially for that purpose. They, they obviously sleep in those, uh, in those uh, underground tunnels. So the, the use that, the, that Hamas makes of it is, of course, a military use. This is in, indispensable to Hamas's modus operandi, indispensable to Hamas's um, military effort. So the name Metro should not you know, denote anything other than this is absolutely and completely military in nature. The problem, of course, is that it is under civilian populated area. So this is where the civilian element comes in, right? The civilians are not using the tunnels. They don't, they don't, they are not in the tunnels, but they live, they go to school, they go to work above those tunnels, right? Using roads and buildings and dwellings that are located just above Hamas's uh, military infrastructure. And that's where, of course, the legal dilemmas uh, come up. How do you target a tunnel? How do you eliminate rocket launchers? How do you e eliminate um, dozens of uh, rocket heads that are stored underground where you have civilians in schools and in bu buildings just above them. So how, do, how does one go about destroying such a tunnel with the most legal, careful, tippy-toeing around uh, the civilian population as, po as much as possible? The law needs to be um, pragmatic. Okay, it's impossible for these tunnels to become completely untouchable from the point of view of Israel uh, because they were dug under civilian infrastructure. First of all, that would be giving Hamas a free hand. And second of all, it would make, um, it would, from the law, point of view of the laws of war, it would mean that these laws are not cognizant of the reality of war, right? States need to still be able to fight, even in complex situations, urban, uh, civilian uh, tunnel, uh, the, the operational complexity needs to be built in the interpretation of the law, but cannot uh, be interpreted so as to render these tunnels completely untouchable. So I think this is the premise from which the IDF um, operates, right? So, so this is the way that the IDF looks at it, right? The need to take precautions while recognizing the complexity and the dilemmas and the need to minimize as much as possible, the harm caused to civilians, that's the people, right? But also civilian infrastructure, that's the schools, the dwellings, the towers, um, and, uh, and, ev and even water aquifers that could be located underground and in the vicinity of the tunnel. So one of the, I guess, more complex issues when trying to destroy this tunnel system that Hamas has built, and as you so eloquently explained that um, it's not off, uh, off limits. It is solely for the purpose of military use. Thus, Israel must be able to target it in a conflict uh, when it's being used militarily. But because it is underground in Gaza, it's not as if Israel is able to send in any engineers underground and take a look exactly how the tunnel is built and where it crosses in every direction, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fortifications. So when they do go and uh, attack these tunnels, in the rare occasion of, God forbid, there is a landslide and a mosque or a school is destroyed or a family home sinks in to one of these tunnels because it goes right underneath its home and now the tunnel was exploded. Um, 
how does that get viewed? We know how it gets viewed from a media perspective. Um, we know how it's viewed by international community and the condemnations that would be pouring in against Israel. Um, however, from a legal perspective, how does that get worked into the concept when you know that the target was not the house, the school, the mosque, the hospital, or any, any of the sort, and you knocked out the tunnel many of kilometers away from that specific location, but because it's a tunnel, it's very easily able to collapse. Absolutely. Let me get a, you know, let me take a step back for a second and just say a few more things before I get to this element of uh, what does that mean in terms of how much harm can legally be caused in order to achieve this military, um, uh, you know, strategic objective. Um, a few things I want to say. First of all, it's important to note that these tunnels that we're looking at from the Operation Guardian of the Walls, they are exclusively the tunnels located inside the Gaza Strip. So this time around, we're talking about only tunnels dug in Gaza and not the cross-border tunnel. Was there a fear that Hamas could, in the middle of the operation, use a cross-border tunnel to, to launch an operation or an invasion into Israeli territory? Definitely. But the operation was focused on those Gaza tunnels themselves and not the cross-border tunnels. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which kind of already takes us into your question, is how important are those tunnels from the perspective of Hamas we, all, we already mentioned. But it's important to also switch the table uh, around, shift the table around and talk about how they are valuable to Israel as a, a legitimate military objective. And they are extremely important to Israel because how do we know this? First of all, as I explained, they are indispensable to how Hamas goes about its business. But most importantly, we, we heard about it during this operation. It was more important for Israel in this particular operation to inflict a blow onto the infrastructure, meaning the tunnels themselves, as opposed to on the forces of Hamas, the militants of Hamas. Meaning what, what the, it seems what, that what the IDF was after this time was to destroy the infrastructure and that was considered more important than killing Hamas operatives, which is not necessarily intuitive. So the value of the target here, the target first of all is mostly the tunnel and the tunnel infrastructure and everything that goes with it and, and, the, and the equipment located inside the tunnels. And to the point where that becomes even more important in terms of a value target than the Hamas operatives themselves. So this takes us to your question, right? What is, how does Israel know exactly what's going on underground and how does it measure this? How does it assess the legality of a strike in the context of an underground um, operation? So here, look, the principles are the same as would apply above ground, okay? Number one, make sure you're targeting a legitimate target, a military target. It's not hard to understand that the tunnels constituted legitimate military targets. Again, because of the importance that they have in the eyes of Hamas and, um, and because they are indispensable to how Hamas conducts its operations. But then come the civilians. It's not because it's a legitimate target that you can go ahead and bomb, carpet bomb all the tunnels like the United States did in Vietnam using B-52 bombers, carpet bombing Kuchi in the, in the hope that the tunnels will also get destroyed in the process and killing many civilians uh, as a result. So that is not the way the laws of war look at it. Even though this is a legitimate target, um, Israel is under an obligation to weigh uh, the kind of damage that, it, that, it, that a strike, the anti-tunnel strike, is expected to cause to civilians and to civilian infrastructure as part of its military operations. So the more valuable the target, the more the laws of war consider it acceptable for civilians to get maimed, to get hurt. This is not a war crime, okay? This is a, tra a human tragedy perhaps, but not a violation of the laws of war. So the laws of war, they do take into account that civilians will get hurt, but they cannot get hurt in a way that would be excessive to the advantage that the IDF would seek to gain from that strike. It's a balancing act, right? What is the value of the target versus how much and depending on that is the amount of civilians that would be considered proportionate. Um, so a war crime is not the killing of any civilian. It could be that civilians, even 10 civilians, unfortunately have been hurt. It could be that an entire school has been destroyed, but this is just not considered 
uh, disproportionate to the importance of the target, meaning the tunnel itself. That's the way the law looks at this. It's an equation. It's not science. It's not mathematics formula. It's a subjective assessment that the commander makes at the time of the attack. Very interesting. And I am sure that there are lawyers advising exactly that before a strike is occurring. Um, one of the major strikes that uh, caught the world's attention specifically um, was Israel knocking out a multi-story apartment complex that housed the AP Bureau, uh, Isla uh, Islamic Jihad, excuse me, Al Jazeera, um, and BBC News and multiple media outlets, foreign journalists were housed in this complex. Um, for years, Israel has known the IDF has had intelligence on this building and has refrained from attacking it in any capacity um, due to those media outlets use of this building. Um, in this particular conflict, Israel took the extreme st step of deciding this building has to come down um, from a military perspective. We don't know all the details as they were not released. However, they were shared with uh, US intelligence and US government officials to prove the IDF's claim. Uh, from what we do know, the IDF has said and it has come out in international papers that the Hamas was working on a special cyber attack that could really harm the Iron Dome and put Israeli civilians in real danger. So with that type of intelligence, how does one act on that, knowing that this is an apartment complex that houses civilians, it houses media outlets that already are not too um, kind towards Israel and their confrontation in Gaza? So when looking at that, how does one really weigh the risks, weigh the, um, the cost-benefit analysis and the military um, outlook when looking at this building, weighing the pros and cons, because at the end of the day, we also know that Israel took the steps to avoid any civilian casualty and gave them more than an hour to leave the building and even witnessed Hamas actors taking computers and servers out of the building, which were probably the IDF hoped to destroy in such an attack. Um, so when you weigh the cost and benefits, how does one look at that specific strike um, from your point of view? That specific tri uh, strike is, is indeed fascinating, and I agree, this, is, this caught the attention. And again, this one has nothing to do with the channel. It was an above-ground uh, structure. But from the point of view of the legality of the strike, I think this is really where, um, where the controversy really, really lies, right? We know that journalists are being protected in time of war. So they are, they are protected persons. They are untouchable. Uh, unless, of course, they, they, they take part in the, in the military operations, which I don't believe was the case here. So the idea is how could you, IDF, target something which is protected under the laws of war? And a building, um, so the journalist doesn't become a target, but the building, if it is being used simultaneously for journalism purposes, which theoretically are being protected, but also as a command and control center or cyber center of attack or, uh, or a place where Hamas and Islamic Jihad are operating freely in and out and holding meetings and planning attacks against Israel, that means that the building has lost its immunity from attack. The building becomes a legitimate target. Fine, but as I said, that doesn't mean that you can go ahead and carpet bomb it because you have to take into account the, the civilians that are inside the building. Now, the laws of war, they say something else, which I think here is the most relevant part. It says, look, if you can, militaries of the world, try to give an advance warning for civilians so that they can leave the place that you're about to strike, and this way they won't be hurt. Try, meaning in some situations, giving this advance warning is going to nullify the whole impact of your strike. But try to do it. It's not an obligation. It's an obligation to do it whenever possible, but not in all situations, because war is complicated. And sometimes you can't warn the enemy about your impending attack. Fine. So Israel decided to actually go ahead and warn the civilians and warn the journalists. And as a result, of course, one Hamas, like you said, Itai, about this strike against the Al Jala Tower. As a result, the building was probably empty. Hamas probably took the computers, et cetera, et cetera. And the strike took place and the building was destroyed. So from the point of view of a textbook application of the laws of war, it's all there, right? Legitimate target, advance warning to civilians, strike, and no civilian casualties. Now, 
so what is the big problem, right? What is the big problem? Well, the tower got destroyed. And the tower is not supposed to be destroyed because it's civilian infrastructure, but the tower was no longer protected. Now, the insanity of this is that there are some people who came and turned the law upon its head and said, look, from the moment that the IDF gave the warning and everyone left the building, including Hamas and including the computers, then the building ceased to be a legitimate target. <laughs> you gave the advance, you gave the warning, right? But then that is somehow taking away the legitimate target's nature. So this is the kind of argument that we're witnessing about this tower. I wouldn't be surprised if this incident eventually makes it to you know, the table of the prosecutor at some point. But I doubt that this is the kind of case that the prosecutor would want to take on um, at the ICC in The Hague. Um, but again, it has led to a lot of discussion. And one of the uh, important um, international lawyer of this world, Professor Michael Schmidt, wrote a blog in Articles of War in which he defended the legality of the strike. Um, I'm not saying that uh, this is a final um, statement on the issue, but I think this is one that needs to be weighed very carefully. And I think that they will weigh that very carefully. Uh, Israel did take the unprecedented step of sharing its intelligence with the United States uh, intelligence community and government in real time so that they would be aware of what was actually being targeted there because uh, one was the AP, which is a very important uh, news outlet worldwide, but obviously United States and uh, freedom of journalism and speech and that runs very deeply in the blood of the US. And uh, so that hit home and was the first real uh, challenge to the Biden administration at looking towards Israel and any conflict with the Palestinians. And I have to say, I think it was handled uh, pretty well from that point on after the controversy sort of uh, lit it up. And I'm just curious though, as you mentioned, they're turning the argument around and saying it ceased to be a legitimate target. Um, and in my opinion, I did completely disagree with that assessment that it ceases to be a legitimate military target. However, I'm trying to figure out what was the um, benefit to the IDF, to Israel, knowing that Hamas evacuated the building, probably took out in that hour the most important information and computers that they needed, what value then was this target to the IDF um, when you weigh it versus the controversy that you said this could end up potentially even landing on the ICC's prosecutor's desk? Look, I, I think one of the arguments that the IDF put forward and um, and to me has a lot of value beyond anything related to Al Jala itself is we are in war, we are at war, uh, and we can share all the information that we have about everything. Um, my understanding is that actually they haven't shared that much information about what was going on in the Al Jala tower. But again, in every strike that the IDF conducts, there are military lawyers who are very experienced who advise the commanders. Obviously the responsibility is that of the commander in the end of the day. But these military lawyers are there. So that's one way in which I tend to think that they must have considered all the ins and outs of this uh, uh, decision. Another thing I want to say is that we're talking about operations that were mostly uh, conducted remotely. Um, we're talking about an, a, a strike that was pre-planned, a target. As you said, the IDF has a had a mass intelligence about for many years. This is not something that in the fog of war, you suddenly decide to strike a building because you see a sniper or you make a mistake in the heat of the battle and with artillery, it, sorry, in a civilian populated area. No, we're talking about something that was probably carefully planned. Does that mean that they could make a mistake? Does that mean that they could reap a value from the strike that is lesser than they expected? Did they think that they, uh, the Hamas would take everything? I don't know. I have no idea of knowing this, but I am, I have some comfort in knowing that this was a pre-planned strike and not something spontaneous in the heat of the battle that military lawyers were advising. And again, um, I, I would assume that the IDF would not take down a building without, uh, without anticipating something like this, like giving the warning, knowing that they would, they would go ahead and maybe take. And maybe there is something else inside the building that was still there at the time they was targeted that we don't know about, or maybe it was a major, strategic and legal mistake. Uh, that's, uh, again, I don't have enough inside information in order to make that call. 
I also uh, like to concur with you there that I do take comfort in the idea that it was a pre-planned attack and that there is uh, much intelligence that the IDF had on this location and weighed it carefully before taking any action. Um, one of the other really interesting parts about this particular conflict is Israel sort of restarted policy of targeted uh, assassinations or killings of top Hamas military uh, people and even went uh, a step of attacking um, a home of one of the ha ha high leaders of Hamas and making sure obviously the home was empty. However, a message was sent to the leader of Hamas. Um, how does the ICC view um, the targeted killings um, by the IDF? As we know that they are a legitimate military target, obviously, this is the opponent, this is the person that you are fighting technically, this is the terrorist. And um, however, there always seems to be controversy whenever Israel does something, especially when it colors inside the lines and uses legal action and legal um, warfare against its enemies. So why is there such controversy about the targeted killings of terrorists? So, so you know that the law on the targeted killing of terrorists was mostly made by the Israeli Supreme Court in a case in 2006 when Israel had, when the Israeli Supreme Court and Chief Justice Aaron Barak was the first in the entire world to have to make a legal uh, determination when it comes to the, the, the big question of when can a terrorist be lawfully targeted. Uh, so he was definitely a trendsetter. This was a decision of the Israeli Supreme Court that is now being taught in every university and in every international law course, or definitely on the laws of war all over the world. So, um, and, and what was the decision in that, in that important uh, uh, holding of the Israeli Supreme Court was that uh, a terrorist can be targeted uh, when he's in the middle of obviously carrying out an attack or planning an attack, but also when we know that they have a, a, a function within a, a a military organization, a terrorist organization that is recurring, that is, we know they call this the revolving door going in and out and constantly returning to this terrorist activity. So there's no doubt, uh, and I think you mentioned it, Itai, that uh, these high level commanders of Hamas are legitimate targets. Again, uh, it could even mean that, that, uh, uh, that uh, the killing of such a high value target could justify, again, and I say this with a grain of salt because uh, it's a, again, human tragedy, but could justify the killing of a certain number of civilians under the laws of war. But Israel will probably go to great lengths to avoid any such harm to civilians, even though the law entitles it. So it would kind of like go beyond the law here. Um, but generally speaking, the killing of these, uh, of these Hamas officials is legitimate and, uh, and perfectly in accordance with the laws of war, especially, especially if no civilians have uh, have been maimed. Now, could the house, the empty house of a, of such a target be a legitimate target if, if the children of this person are also using it? That's a more complicated question, right? In a way, the question of whether the person is, the tar is a legitimate target is easier because this is the terrorist, this is the person who can, according to the laws of war, um, who has lost its immunity and can be targeted. But the house, the house in and of itself, that I would think would be more open to discussion. Excellent. And now before we transition to looking at the ICC a little care more carefully, um, I'd like to bring up my personal question that I have found to be very interesting when it comes to this conflict specifically and looking at crimes of war. Um, how come the international community and Israel legitimately, I believe, uh, call the rocket fire from Hamas a war crime? a double war crime even, firing it from a civilian location, uh, i.e. changing a school to now becoming a military target potentially, and firing it at civilian uh, targets. What I find disturbing, and I'm not sure how to go about my understanding of this, and hence why I'd love to ask you this question, is by saying these things, which are legitimate and true, does it, does it not equate Hamas and Israel, sort of putting them on the same playing field. The state of Israel, who takes such great precautions um, against potential civilian loss of life, and we know this, yet is equated on the same level as a terrorist organization that is committing double war crimes. 
Is it a problem to call these war crimes when they're committed by terrorists and not just call them acts of terror? Um, because when calling it a war crime, you are equating them in the state of Israel uh, or as a state period, because states commit war crimes in that sense. And it's states that get prosecuted at the ICC. I mean, individuals representing the state. So at what point do we look at it and say, look, these are terrorists. This is in a state. And if there are legitimate state, then we have to be, they have to be held to the same standards. But since they are not considered a state and at the same standards, um, however, we're putting Israel and Hamas sort of on the same playing field here, that they're two legitimate militaries almost attacking one another. And I find that to be quite disturbing because this is a legitimate military uh, of a state going after a terrorist organization that is shooting projectiles into the civilian population of its state. I find it quite hard to reconcile this. Maybe you can explain it a little better to me. The way to look at it is, um, is to think about Hamas and Israel as actually both completely subject to the same rule, okay? The fact that Hamas is not a state or that Palestine, you know, you can argue about the legal status of the entity, that doesn't really matter from the perspective of the laws of war. Uh, because the principle of not intentionally targeting civilians is a principle that applies to all belligerents in all situations of conflict. So it applies equally to Hamas and to Israel. Now, this is an opportunity, I think, more than a liability to say Hamas is committing war crimes. It's, it's a good thing that Hamas is subject to these rules, even though it's not a state. It's a good thing that we can call on these violations that Hamas is committing by number one, firing from civilian populated area. And we saw there was a tunnel in an UNRWA school. I mean, we're talking about really in proximity to, to where children are learning. And at the same time, intentionally targeting uh, Israeli civilians. So this is the idea of the double war crime. But so on the, on the contrary, it's not a liability. Think about the ICC prosecutor again. It means that the mandate of the ICC prosecutor is both to examine the conduct of Israel's actions, of the IDF, of Israeli soldiers, but also in a equal, exactly similar way to look at the conduct of Hamas. So it's a, it, it, yes, it puts it, there's a certain equality between the two sides, but I think in the eyes of the law, it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, let's examine also what Hamas is doing. And, and, um, and so, and I wanna tell you one more thing. At the ICC, there has been um, already a trial of a terrorist operative, one trial, uh, of a man called Al Mahdi, who was a member of Ansar Dine, an offshoot of Al Qaeda, and stood trial and was convicted um, for his actions in Mali because he intentionally, uh, intentionally directed strikes at uh, cultural sites and uh, religious sites that are protected under the laws of war. So the fact that he was a terrorist working for a terrorist organization, um, that did not prevent him from standing trial and being indicted by the ICC. So we are in a world where terrorist organizations are completely subject and recognized as being under those rules. And I think this is, uh, I see it more as a, an opportunity to, to call on these crimes that they are committing rather than as a way to, to say, okay, this is a liability or, uh, or a moral problem. No, they are under the same rules and we don't really care what their status is as, is, as an entity. Very interesting. And I think that uh, eloquently explains the situation. Um, having said that, I did come up with a follow-up question as it spurred many different questions. But most importantly, does that mean that potentially um, Israel, uh, the United States, any other country fighting the war on terror globally, especially, should maybe potentially be looking at um, arrests and trying to capture um, some of these uh, high-level terrorists and just bringing them to the ICC and putting them on trial there? Or is that becoming now too risky, not just for your own military, but also in the sense of seeking justice, because now you have to uh, put out your intelligence on how come you know this person is so involved in terrorism? Um, is that something that you think is being weighed? Because we saw for a long time, uh, just looking at the fight against organized crime around the world, it was always, you know, gun battles, police going into locations, there'd be shootouts, 
Um, eventually, especially in the United States, it became a very big legal battle. And we saw RICO cases and we saw the only way they were able to get Al Capone was on taxes at the end of the day. But they used the legal means to get these people off the streets. Um, is using the ICC as a threat against some of these terrorists an actual legitimate idea? Or is this really a conflict of uh, flesh and blood? So two things. Um, the first one is that we need to understand that when for the ICC to become involved, um, it is mostly as a result of um, the state that is connected to the conflict, that was a belligerent in the conflict, not being able or willing to take on these individuals, let's say a terrorist operative, and investigate the crimes that were committed. So arrest and trial in a country of origin is what I'm trying to say, is always an option, okay? States are always able to do this themselves. The ICC and the interna represents the international community in the hope of putting an end to impunity, meaning no one is going to escape justice, even if they're, you know, uh, a top, uh, you know, very connected politician, even a sitting head of state. Um, but again, the idea is that the states themselves need to do the job first. I believe uh, even uh, 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 Mr. Khan, who took over uh, as ICC prosecutor two days ago, said it as a, in his inaugural speech. He said that um, The Hague is only a city of last resort. What does that mean? First, do it in your home country, okay? Come to The Hague only if there's no other option. So that's the first thing I want to say. The state is always in control and the state sovereignty is protected by that principle, which we call the principle of complementarity. So the Hague doesn't replace states. It complements states if states can do it. That's the first thing. And the other thing is, is, is equally important, I think, to answer your question. And that is, do states have a problem relying on the Hague or cooperating with the Hague because they're afraid of giving legitimacy to an institution with which they might have an, a certain ambivalence because they're also maybe uh, in later, later on or even right now going to consider crimes committed by their nationals, etc. So this has been, from the point of view of Israel, a major line of policy, right? We, uh, Israel is, 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 is very often um, taking uh, uh, the view that cooperating, at least in the open, um, or using international institutions as a way to confer on them legitimacy that later on could come and haunt the state. I disagree with this. I'm always in favor of engagement, in favor of multilateralism. I think that these uh, are actually, again, opportunities for Israel to make uh, a case to share some of the security concerns um, and to be in dialogue with the rest of the world as opposed to behind uh, always you know, behind the scenes, which I think achieves results, but only to a certain limited extent. So I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of engagement. I'm in favor of using these institutions. Uh, and I'm, I think the legitimacy argument is, is quite a weak one. Excellent uh, points that you made there, Dr. Lishman Barak. Um, I think it's an important way to transition exactly into my next question here. Um, and that is the ICC, the court itself, and its undertaking of um, of Israel as a case study, if you will, as to prosecute Israelis um, for war crimes in different capacities. Now, the one thing, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Chief Justice Aaron Barak has set precedent in the field of conflict and terrorism that is taught now around the world, his uh, ruling on targeted killings that you mentioned here on this podcast today. Uh, many other rulings by the Chief Justice Barak um, have been studied across law schools. Um, the Israeli Supreme Court is one of the most robust courts on the planet. It takes up many cases. It takes on its government. It takes on the military. It takes on civilians. Um, it is not afraid to take on very tough cases and make judgments and pass judgment. Um, how come the ICC continues to target Israel when it has such a robust justice system that is independent of the government and the military and does hold its own accountable. As we have seen prime ministers be prosecuted, presidents be prosecuted, military officials be prosecuted when crimes have been committed by these potential people. No one is immune from the Israeli Supreme Court in this country. So knowing that, why does the ICC continue to target, as, as, as you explained, it is a court of last resort when the, when the country itself cannot provide the uh, justice to the people and to outsiders. 
So, you know, in your previous question, you mentioned uh, are Israel and, the, and Hamas kind of considered on the level playing field here, even though they're operating under very different rules of conduct. And I'll tell you in a, a place where it is different. And that is in, exactly in respect of what you just asked. When it comes to Israel, the prosecutor, the ICC, they know that they will have to look at what Israel has done, whether Israel has investigated, whether Israel has put on trial soldiers or individuals who are suspected of having violated uh, international law or the laws of war. So this is something that is going to be necessarily part of the examination, upcoming examination by the ICC when it comes to Israel. What about when it comes to Hamas? Well, when it comes to Hamas, there was already a statement that was made by, the, by Fatou Ben Souda, the ICC prosecutor, until a few days ago. And she said, when it comes to Hamas, we won't have to look into this because we know Hamas did not look at any potential violation, did not investigate any of it. So what is at the heart of this discrepancy here? It is this belief that in Israel there is a proper legal system that is operating, whether it's the military system or the civilian system, that, that it is a seriously functioning um, a, a legal and con constitutional system. Whereas in the case of Hamas, there's not even any doubt that this, 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 is, not, this is not there. So you don't even need to look for it or analyze it or, in, or, or, or inquire about it. So here, definitely, the, the, the distinction stands. I think there is a lot of respect that the Israeli Supreme Court has gained over the years in particular, thanks to the work of incredible judges and individuals like Aaron Barak, not only, of course, but definitely has a standing. You know, when the Israeli Supreme Court decided that Israel needs to continue providing humanitarian aid to, in Gaza, even after Israel disengaged from the Gaza Strip and was no longer considered the occupier, but the Israeli Supreme Court said for humanitarian reasons, we still need to provide the minimum electricity and other humanitarian uh, functions. What is that? So that gains the respect of the outside world. And there is a lot of deference to the Israeli Supreme Court and to the Israeli legal system. Does that mean that that's going to shield the Israel from any kind of investigation? Definitely not. And probably not on the settlement, right? But uh, at least there is the sense that we need to check what's going on there before we make any final statement as to whether or not Israel has done its job. This, is, this has to be done seriously and with the respect that is needed vis-a-vis -vis Israeli institutions. And before I transition exactly into that question of settlements to you, um, and we examine slightly the ICC before we let you go, I'd like, to make, uh, I'd like to make it also known to our audience that may not know that even during this conflict, Israel was cognizant of the humanitarian situation inside Gaza and on multiple occasions was trying to transfer humanitarian aid into Gaza through the Erez crossing, and Hamas targeted the Israeli soldiers and civilians that were bringing in the aid into Gaza, uh, hitting a couple of the trucks with mortar shells and injuring multiple Israeli soldiers. Um, so we see what Israel gets for trying to provide humanitarian aid into Gaza, yet nonetheless took the unprecedented steps that even under fire was trying to provide uh, humanitarian aid. And I'd like that just to be for the record, for our audience that may not know that that was happening, because that's an important thing to be known. Um, there is- If I may, if I add something here, in addition to this uh, issue of the humanitarian aid, I think it's also worth noting that in the midst of the operation, the ICC made its voice heard. The ICC prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, she tweeted in English and in Hebrew that any action that was taken during this conflict, meaning guardian of the wall, would fall within her mandate to investigate, would fall within the competence of the International Criminal Court. This is something that is quite unusual, uh, but she made that statement. Was it meant as a deterrent or was it meant as a, uh, you know, a warning uh, or was it meant as a way to communicate to her successor? Uh, it, probably all of this at the same time. But I think it's remarkable that in the midst of the conflict, you'd have an ICC prosecutor say, okay, wait a second, all of this is under my mandate. I also think that that's very interesting and very important that you brought up. Um, in my opinion, that shows the politicization of the Israeli conflict by the ICC, um, but that's for another time. As we continue on, as you made mention, two days ago was the transition of prosecutors. 
uh, at the ICC. So from a technical standpoint, I have a real technical question that hopefully you're able to answer here. When this type of pass off happens, um, any of the cases that the previous prosecutor was working on in, at any level from opening her first time reading a, a brief to being ready to take something all the way to judges. Um, where, does, where do those cases stand now? Does the new prosecutor have to review them all and make decisions on their own? Or do they have to continue the work that the previous prosecutor has already put in place? Okay, so this technical question, um, as you know, first of all, the ICC is quite a new body, okay? It's only been around for 20 years. We're only on the third prosecutor. So it's not like we have a huge amount of history, institutional history that we can build on, but nevertheless, clearly a new prosecutor is going to show deference and respect for what the predecessor has done. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's also in a, within, written within the Rome Statute, the, the, the treaty that established the ICC. However, the prosecutor, the new prosecutor still has a lot of discretion and we can't take that away from him. Okay, Mr. Khan has the opportunity to, first of all, establish priorities within the caseload of the court. That is probably his, the, the place where he has the most margin of maneuver, okay? The court is overloaded. It doesn't have the resources that it needs. This has been made very clear by Fatou Ben Souda, by Khan, and by an independent review of experts a few months ago. So clearly things have to be recalibrated so as to decide what is more important and what should we invest resources in. There's also a lot of internal dysfunctionalities within the court that need to be addressed related to sexual harassment and other things that he even mentioned in his inaugural statement. So he's got a lot of leeway. The ICC prosecutor is a very powerful job. Um, and clearly, if he wants to put things on the back burner, he's got the option to do it, okay? But he's tied to some of the things that she's already done and that's, that's perfectly, I think, understandable. Um, so he's taking over and when we look at it from the perspective of the uh, Palestine investigation, which has been formally opened by, the, by Fatou Ben Souda before she left, clearly she wanted to leave this legacy. Clearly it was important for her to get this done before she left so that the thing wouldn't be up in the air. Uh, but he still has to decide why specific situations does he want to investigate? Um, are there specific individuals? Eventually he's gonna have to narrow it down to individuals that he wants to, uh, to, to, to you know, put in the spotlight here. Um, does he want to include anything from Guardian of the Wall? Uh, does he think that that the that he's really in sound, on sound legal grounds to proceed with this uh, investigation to issue arrest warrant? By the way, I'll just say one more thing. Israel still has an opportunity to question, one last opportunity to question the court's jurisdiction, and that would probably be around the time that if arrest warrants are issued, Israel at that time would, under the Rome Statute, still be entitled to challenge the jurisdiction of the court. So. Bottom line, this, is ain't, oh, this ain't be over, right? This is, there still is a lot of work to be done. It could still take many years and Khan it, it is really going to shape this going forward. Uh, very interesting. And before we let you go, as you've taken much of your day out for us here at the podcast and we appreciate it, um, you mentioned settlements and how that's a potential uh, firework, if you will, at the ICC. And I find that specifically to be very interesting on multiple levels, specifically the former prosecutor, she said on February 18th in her public address, she promised to um, make a, a precedent or make a decision on the Cyprus settlements, um, sort of to, I guess, equate Israeli occupation and settlements and Turkish occupation and settlements thus giving major legal precedent to what could potentially be looked at here in Israel. That was not done. Um, and we want to know from your perspective why you think that is. But my other question when it comes to settlements and the legality of them, specifically, Israel has signed onto an international agreement with the Palestinians called the Oslo Accords, which divided the West Bank into area A, B, and C, A being fully controlled by the Palestinian Authority, B jointly administered by Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and area C completely in Israeli control. When Israel builds a settlement in area C, for example, an area that under the agreement with the Palestinians is under full Israeli control, how is that considered a war crime? 
why would a settlement then be considered a war crime when there is an agreement between the parties that was looked at by the international community and said, okay, we went to the Madrid conference, we had the Oslo Accords, both sides signed on them. This is what we're using as the basis for peace process and talks. Why would the ICC intervene itself, put itself in the middle and start to discuss settlements on an issue, as I said, is already sort of settled or enshrined in an international agreement between the two sides? You know, I would even go further and say that it's also enshrined in the UN uh, resolutions that anything related to border territories uh, has to be decided uh, by the Palestinians and the Israelis on a bilateral uh, basis. So definitely, um, I think this is, this is very clear from all of kind of like the legal framework that governs this, this issue. Um, let me, let me uh, say a few things about, first of all, the Turkish occupation of Northern Cyprus, which as you uh, mentioned, was uh, brought up to the attention of Fatou Ben Souda, and there was an, uh, an attempt at in, uh, you know, triggering the opening of an investigation but uh, she never actually responded to this request. Um, now, there's a bunch of things that she did not close before she left, including uh, some matters regarding Yemen and Cambodia, and including this issue of the Turkish uh, occupation of Northern Cyprus. Um, is this a political matter? Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I know it was criticized on the basis that, you know, Clearly, she didn't want to say anything about these settlements. They look very much like the ones that uh, Israel is, uh, uh, you know, accused of, of building, etc. I'm not so sure. I actually, um, I'm not so sure that Fatou Ben Souda was uh, had anything anti-Semitic to her or anything against Israel. I know Israelis are very critical of her, but I think she put herself on the line a couple times, um, and and she paid a lot of political capital and was under a tremendous amount of pressure that eventually, you know. Uh, came out, you know, she, she, had to, she had to act because of, of this pressure. Is that legitimate or not? It's a different issue, but I don't think she was naturally inclined to do anything, um, uh, everything she could to, to incriminate Israel. But that's, I would leave that aside. Regarding the legality of the settlement, I don't want to get into the legality per se, but I want to say that from the point of view of the ICC, the settlements constitute a very safe route to, to, um, to go by. Why? because the settlements, whether they are illegal or legal under international is a different story, but they are not considered as illegal by Israel and they are part of Israel's policy. As a result, Israel is clearly not investigating anything regarding the settlement because it doesn't, record, it doesn't look at it as being a problem. So if this is part of Israeli policy, it means that Israel is not investigating and it means that the shield that we spoke about before, which, um, which says that if Israel does the investigation itself, then it won't be transferred to the international institutions. This cannot happen with respect to the settlement. The settlements are an issue which is safe for the court because it doesn't require an assessment of any kind of investigation under, you know, uh, undertaken by Israel because Israel has not undertaken any investigation when it comes to the settlement. So it's easy. There's no filter. There's no obstacle. It's much easier to go that route. So I would be very wary of that because it's a much safer um, ground for the prosecutor, which also, going back to your previous question, doesn't require him to pass judgment on the Israeli legal system. So that is something that I would be very, very careful of. So having said that, how is any settlement for that matter, not necessarily the Israeli settlement or Cyprus settlements, any settlement for that matter, considered a war crime. What in the idea of a settlement is considered a war crime, worthy of rising to the level of the ICC? Uh, that's a very, very good question. The, uh, the, uh, you're right that the ICC is supposed to look into only grave, um, grave there's a threshold of gravity, right, for the ICC to become involved. Um, and we, we, we are looking at this special court that was established in order to end impunity, as I mentioned, and put only the most serious violations that shock the conscience of humanity in, you know, on trial. Um, so is a transfer of population from uh, one territory to occupied territory by the occupying power, is that a grave violation that would justify the involvement of the ICC? The only possible answer I can give to this question is yes, under the Rome Statute. 
The Rome Statute includes this transfer of population and settlements as part of the crimes over which it has jurisdiction. Now, then you have to go back to 1998 and the, the writing, the drafting of the Rome Statute and ask, how come this crime was included? Well, that may very well have been as a result of like a long-term view that eventually the settlement, maybe even specifically the Israeli settlement, would make it before the court. I'm not sure that there was not something political there at that time, because I agree with you, this crime is not exactly on the same standing of gravity, at least prima facie, when we look at other things like genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, that appear in the Rome Statute. Um, in your personal opinion, if something like settlements were to make it in front of the court, um, from an Israeli perspective, is bringing up Cyprus, Tibet, other occupied lands, if you will, um, a legal defense, or they would have to find a different defense mechanism uh, at the court to fight this if it were to ever rise to that level? That's a very good question, Itai. This kind of uh, arguments have not, have not been very successful in the past. Um, because the main argument is, okay, so maybe those settlements in, you know, the Turkish occupation of Northern Cyprus, maybe that's also illegal. How does that detract from a potential crime committed by Israel? I'm not sure it's going to help. Um, would it help to say the international community has consistently criticized Israel's action, but it's done nothing about Western Sahara or the Turkish occupation of Northern Cyprus? Would that help? I also doubt it, to be honest. So yes, something more creative, something more powerful, trying something that hasn't been done before, um, relying exclusively on provisions of the Rome Statute, I would think that would be, um, that would be more promising. And before we let you go, I'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, explain to our audience a little bit about the different work that you do. Um, you do such a wide range of work between writing, teaching, um, setting up conferences, everything that you do, um, which I always find to be the most amazing and impressive uh, work I would love to give you that opportunity here on the program to give a little bit of explanation um, because you have dived in the last couple of years headfirst into the whole underground warfare um, problem and tactic used now by militaries and terrorists. Again, as you have made mention, this is a historical tactic that has been used throughout history for anyone that hasn't uh, had the opportunity to pick up underground warfare. Uh, by Dr. Daphne Richemont Barak, an excellent book, but you've been in collaboration with other institutions and other military experts um, like John Spencer, and uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into the work that you're doing on the underground front, conferences that you are involved with, uh, websites that are going up, and any other publications that you may uh, be interested to let our audience know. Yeah, thank you. You're too kind, Ita. You're really too kind, but I think this podcast actually exemplifies really the things that I've done. Look at how we connected, how you, you connected. Um, the, the work on, you know, the operational understanding of underground warfare that I've tried to really bring uh, awareness to and the legal aspect and how the ICC and Gu Operation Guardian of the Walls, everything is really connected. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, right? To try to show that the laws of war don't ex exist in a vacuum, that it's important to understand the operational uh, reality and that the law needs to be cognizant of that. So I do a lot of interdisciplinary work that brings together security studies and I also work on Iron Dome and, and, and other aspects of contemporary warfare and also uh, you know, tie them to, uh, to the legal and ethical and moral aspects, the morality of war. Now, um, I'm affiliated with the Modern War Institute at West Point and with the Lieber Institute of Law and Land Warfare also at West Point. Um, together with these partners uh, and with the ICT, of course, um, and with the IDC uh, School of Government, the Lauder School, uh, we've established an international working group on subterranean warfare. And we have a website that is under the IDC Lauder School um, uh, main portal, uh, where we, that we've, we've, we've built together for two reasons, right? To enhance uh, uh, awareness, as I mentioned, but also preparedness in the face of subterranean threats but also to create a community of experts to get people who either have never heard about the subterranean or have been researching it and we have no idea that they've been doing so together in a, help, in a hope that, uh, that this um, will, that eventually there'll be you know, sharing of best practices and, um, and more debate and more scholarly writing about, about these issues. But I think this podcast, if anything, is the best uh, exemplification of uh, how the various aspects of my work 
kind of uh, converge and, and, and hopefully shed a different light onto these developments? Uh, all your writings that we know of through the ICT can go to the ICT website to find them. Uh, where could someone purchase your book, The Underground Warfare? Uh, Oxford University Press or our good old friend, Amazon.com. Excellent. And I know because I follow you on Twitter, um, but for any of our audience that does not know you're on Twitter, what would be your Twitter handle for them to be able to go and follow you? Because that is where your latest work and publications get first posted to the world. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I, um, the working group, the International Working Group on Subterranean Warfare is also quite, uh, um, uh, you know, gets connected also via Twitter. So definitely, I encourage you. It's uh, at Richmond Barak. Uh, R-I-C-H-E-M-O-N-D-B-A-R-A-K in one word, so you can find me there. Thank you, Itai. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Daphne Richemont Barak. Um, she is a professor at the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy, serves as the academic head of the International Program of Government, and the senior researcher at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, as well as the head of the Law Desk, award-winning author, as I have said and mentioned, a must pick up for anyone interested in subterranean warfare, underground warfare, by the incomparable Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us on Counterterrorism Today, the premier podcast of the ICT. I'm Itai Hanman. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Barak. Thank you.